The City of the Singing Flame Forward. We had been friends for a decade or more, and I knew Giles Angarth as well as anyone could purport to know him. Yet the thing was no less a mystery to me than to others at the time, and it is still a mystery. Sometimes I think that he and Ebonley had designed it all between them as a huge, insoluble hoax, that they are still alive somewhere and are laughing at the world that has been so sorely baffled by their disappearance. And sometimes I make tentative plans to revisit Crater Ridge and find, if I can, the two boulders mentioned in Angarth's narrative as having a vague resemblance to broken-down columns. In the meanwhile, no one has uncovered any trace of the missing men or has heard even the faintest rumor concerning them. And the whole affair, it would seem, is likely to remain a most singular and exasperating riddle. Angarth, whose fame as a writer of fantastic fiction will probably outlive that of most other modern magazine contributors, had been spending that summer among the Sierras, and had been living alone till the artist Felix Ebenley went to visit him. Ebenley, whom I had never met, was well known for his imaginative paintings and drawings, and he had illustrated more than one of Angarth's novels. When neighboring campers became alarmed over the prolonged absence of the two men, and the cabin was searched for some possible clue, a package addressed to me was found lying on the table, and I received it in due course of time, after reading many newspaper speculations regarding the double vanishment. The package contained a small, leather-bound notebook. Angarth had written on the flyleaf. Dear Hastain, you can publish this journal sometime, if you like. People will think it the last and wildest of all my fictions, unless they take it for one of your own. In either case, it will be just as well. Goodbye. Faithfully, Giles Angarth. I am now publishing the journal, which will doubtless meet the reception he predicted but I'm not so certain myself as to whether the tale is truth or fabrication. The only way to make sure will be to locate the two boulders, and anyone who has ever seen Crater Ridge and has wandered over its miles of rock-strewn desolation will realize the difficulties of such a task. The Journal July 31, 1930 I have never acquired the diary-keeping habit, mainly, no doubt, because of my uneventful mode of existence, in which there has seldom been anything to chronicle. But the thing which happened this morning is so extravagantly strange, so remote from mundane laws and parallels, that I feel impelled to write it down to the best of my understanding and ability. Also, I shall keep account of the possible repetition and continuation of my experience. It will be perfectly safe to do this, for no one who ever reads the record will be likely to believe it. I had gone for a walk on Crater Ridge, which lies a mile or less to the north of my cabin near Summit. Though differing markedly in its character from the usual landscapes roundabout, it is one of my favorite places. It is exceptionally bare and desolate, with little more in the way of vegetation than mountain sunflowers, wild currant bushes, and a few sturdy, wind-warped pines and supple tamaracks. Geologists deny it a volcanic origin, Yet its outcroppings of rough, nodular stone and enormous rubble heaps have all the air of scoriac remains, at least to my non-scientific eye. They look like the slag and refuse of cyclopean furnaces, poured out in pre-human years to cool and harden into shapes of limitless grotesquerie. Among them are stones that suggest the fragments of primordial bas-reliefs, or small, prehistoric idols and figurines and others that seem to have been graven with lost letters of an indecipherable script. Unexpectedly, there is a little tarn lying on one end of the long, dry ridge, a tarn that has never been fathomed. The hill is an odd interlude among the granite sheets and crags and the fur-clothed ravines and valleys of this region. It was a clear, windless morning, and I paused often to view the magnificent perspectives of varied scenery that were visible on every hand the titan battlements of Castle Peak, the rude masses of Donner Peak with its dividing pass of hemlocks, the remote luminous blue of the Nevada Mountains, and the soft green of willows in the valley at my feet. It was an aloof, silent world, 
and I heard no sound other than the dry, crackling noise of cicadas among the currant bushes. I strolled on in a zigzag manner for some distance, and, coming to one of the rubble fields with which the ridge is interstrewn, I began to search the ground closely, hoping to find a stone that was sufficiently quaint and grotesque in its form to be worth keeping as a curiosity. I had found several such in my previous wanderings. Suddenly, I came to a clear space amid the rubble in which nothing grew, a space that was round as an artificial ring. In the center were two, two isolated boulders, queerly alike in shape, and lying about five feet apart. I paused to examine them. Their substance, a dull greenish-gray stone, seemed to be different from anything else in the neighborhood, and I conceived at once the weird, unwarrantable fancy that they might be the pedestals of vanished columns, worn away by incalculable years till there remained only these sunken ends. Certainly the perfect roundness and uniformity of the boulders was peculiar, and, th and though I possess a smattering of geology, I could not identify their smooth, soapy material. My imagination was excited, and I began to indulge in some rather overheated fantasies. But the wildest of these was a homely commonplace in comparison with the thing that happened when I took a single step forward and forward in the vacant space immediately between the two boulders. I shall try to describe it to the utmost of my verbal ability, though human language is naturally wanting in words that are adequate for the delineation of events and sensations beyond the normal scope of human experience. Nothing is more disconcerting than to miscalculate the degree of descent in taking a step. Imagine then what it was like to step forward on level, open ground, and find utter nothingness underfoot. I seemed to be going down into an empty gulf, and at the same time the landscape before me vanished in a swirl of broken images and everything went blind. There was a feeling of intense, hyperborean cold and an indescribable sickness and vertigo possessed me, due, no doubt, to the profound disturbance of equilibrium. Also, either from the speed of my descent or for some other reason, I was totally unable to draw breath. My thoughts and feelings were unutterably confused, and half the time it seemed to me that I was falling upward rather than downward, or was sliding horizontally at some oblique angle. At last I had the sensation of turning a complete somersault, and then I found myself standing erect on solid ground once more, without the least shock or jar of impact. The darkness cleared away from my vision, but I was still dizzy, and the optical images I received were altogether meaningless for some moments. When finally I recovered the power of cognizance and was able to view my surroundings with a measure of perception, I experienced a mental confusion equivalent to that of a man who might find himself cast without warning on the shore of some foreign planet. There was the same sense of utter loss and alienation which would assuredly be felt in such a case. The same vertiginous, overwhelming bewilderment, the same ghastly sense of separation from all the familiar environmental details that give color and form and definition to our lives and even determine our very personalities. I was standing in the midst of a landscape which bore no degree or manner of resemblance to Crater Ridge, a long, gradual slope covered with violet grass and studded at intervals with stones of monolithic size and shape ran undulantly away beneath me to a broad plain with sinuous, open meadows and high, stately forests of an unknown vegetation, whose predominant hues were purple, and yellow. The plain seemed to end in a wall of impenetrable golden brownish mist that rose with phantom pinnacles to dissolve on a sky of luminescent amber in which there was no sun. In the foreground of this amazing scene, not more than two or three miles away, there loomed a city whose massive towers and mountainous ramparts of red stone were such as the Anakim of undiscovered worlds might build. Wall on beetling wall, and spire on giant spire, it soared to confront the heavens, maintaining everywhere the severe and solemn lines of a holy, 
rectilinear architecture. It seemed to whelm and crush down the beholder with its stern and crag-like imminence. As I viewed this city, I forgot my initial sense of bewildering loss and alienage in an awe with which something of actual terror was mingled. And at the same time, I felt an obscure but profound allurement, the cryptic emanation of some enslaving spell. But after I had gazed a while, the cosmic strangeness and bafflement of my unthinkable position returned upon me, and I felt only a wild desire to escape from the maddeningly oppressive bizarrery of this region and regain my own world. In an effort to fight down my agitation, I tried to figure out, if possible, what had really happened. I had read a number of transdimensional stories, in fact I had written one or two myself, and I had often pondered the possibility of other worlds or material planes which may coexist in the same space with ours, invisible and impalpable to human senses. Of course, I realized at once that I had fallen into some such dimension. Doubtless, when I took that step forward between the boulders, I had been precipitated into some sort of flaw or fissure in space to emerge at the bottom in this alien sphere, in a totally different kind of space. It sounded simple enough, in a way, but not simple enough to make the modus operandi anything but a brain-racking mystery. In a further effort to collect myself, I studied my immediate surroundings with a close attention. This time, I was impressed by the arrangement of the monolithic stones I have spoken of, many of which were disposed at fairly regular intervals in two parallel lines running down the hill as if to mark the course of some ancient road obliterated by the purple grass. Turning to follow its ascent, I saw right behind me two columns, standing at precisely the same distance apart as the two odd boulders on Crater Ridge, and formed of the same soapy greenish-gray stone. The pillars were perhaps nine feet high, and had been taller at one time since the tops were splintered and broken away. Not far above them, the mounting slope vanished from view in a great bank of the same golden-brown mist that enveloped the remoter plain. But there were no more monoliths, and it seemed as if the road had ended with those pillars. Inevitably, I began to speculate as to the relationship between the columns in this new dimension and the boulders in my own world. Surely the resemblance could not be a matter of mere chance. If I stepped between the columns... Could I return to the human sphere by a reversal of my precipitation therefrom? And if so, by what inconceivable beings from foreign time and space had the columns and boulders been established as the portals of a gateway between the two worlds? Who could have used the gateway? And for what purpose? My brain reeled before the infinite vistas of surmise that were opened by such questions. However, what concerned me most was the problem of getting back to Crater Ridge. The weirdness of it all, the monstrous walls of the nearby town, the unnatural hues and forms of the outlandish scenery were too much for human nerves, and I felt that I should go mad if forced to remain long in such a milieu. Also, there was no telling what hostile powers or entities I might encounter if I stayed. The slope and plain were devoid of animate life as far as I could see but the great city was presumptive proof of its existence. Unlike the heroes in my own tales, who were wont to visit the fifth dimension or the worlds of Algol with the perfect sang-froid, I did not feel in the least adventurous, and I shrank back with man's instinctive recoil before the unknown. With one fearful glance at the looming city and the wide plain, with its lofty, gorgeous vegetation, I turned and stepped back between the columns. There was the same instantaneous plunge into blind and freezing gulfs, the same indeterminate falling and twisting that had marked my descent into this new dimension. At the end, I found myself standing, very dizzy and shaken, on the same spot from which I had taken my forward step between the greenish-gray boulders. Crater Ridge was swirling and reeling about me as if in the throes of earthquake and I had to sit down for a minute or two before I could recover my equilibrium. I came back to the cabin like a man in a dream. 
the experience seemed and still seems incredible and unreal. And yet, it has overshadowed everything else and has colored and dominated all my thoughts. Perhaps, by writing it down, I can shake it off a little. It has unsettled me more than any previous experience in my whole life, and the world about me seems hardly less improbable and nightmarish than the one that I have penetrated in a fashion so fortuitous. August 2nd. I have done a lot of thinking in the past few days, and the more I ponder and puzzle, the more mysterious it all becomes. Granting the flaw in space, which must be an absolute vacuum, impervious to air, ether, light, and matter, how was it possible for me to fall into it? And having fallen in, how could I fall out? Particularly into a sphere that has no certifiable relationship with ours. But, after all, one process would be as easy as the other, in theory. The main objection is, how could one move in a vacuum, either up or down or backward or forward? The whole thing would baffle the comprehension of an Einstein, and I do not feel that I have even approached the true solution. Also, I have been fighting the temptation to go back, if only to convince myself that the thing really occurred. But after all, why shouldn't I go back? An opportunity has been vouchsafed to me such as no man may ever have been given before, and the wonders I shall see and the secrets I shall learn are beyond imagining. My nervous trepidation is inexcusably childish under the circumstances. August 3rd. I went back this morning, armed with a revolver. Somehow, without thinking that it might make a difference, I did not step in the very middle of the space between the boulders. Undoubtedly, as a result of this, my descent was more prolonged and impetuous than before, and seemed to consist mainly of a series of spiral somersaults, it must have taken me minutes to recover from the ensuing vertigo, and when I came to, I was lying on the violet grass. This time I went boldly down the slope, and keeping as much as I could in the shelter of the bizarre purple and yellow vegetation, I stole toward the looming city. All was very still, and there was no breath of wind in these exotic trees, which appeared to imitate in their lofty, upright boles and horizontal foliage the severe architectural lines of the Cyclopean buildings. I had not gone far when I came to a road in the forest, a road paved with stupendous blocks of stone at least twenty feet square. It ran toward the city. I thought for a while that it was wholly deserted, perhaps disused, and I even dared to walk upon it, till I heard a noise behind me, and turning, saw the approach of several singular entities, Terrified, I sprang back and hid myself in a thicket from which I watched the passing of those creatures, wondering fearfully if they had seen me. Apparently my fears were groundless, for they did not even glance at my hiding place. It is hard for me to describe or even visualize them now, for they were totally unlike anything that we are accustomed to think of as human or animal. They must have been ten feet tall and they were moving along with colossal strides that took them from sight in a few instants beyond a turn of the road. Their bodies were bright and shining, as if encased in some sort of armor, and their heads were equipped with high, curving appendages of opalescent hues, which nodded above them like fantastic plumes, but may have been antennae or other sense organs of a novel type. Trembling with excitement and wonder, I continued my progress through the richly colored undergrowth. As I went on, I perceived for the first time that there were no shadows anywhere. The light came from all portions of the sunless amber heaven, pervading everything with a soft, uniform luminosity. All was motionless and silent, as I have said before, and there was no evidence of bird, insect, or animal life in all this preternatural landscape. But when I had advanced to within a mile of the city, as well as I could judge the distance in a realm where the very proportions of objects were unfamiliar, I became aware of something which at first was recognizable as a vibration rather than a sound. There was a queer thrilling in my nerves, the disquieting sense of some unknown force or emanation flowing through my body. This was perceptible for some time before I heard the music. But having heard it, 
my auditory nerves identified it at once with the vibration. It was faint and far off, and seemed to emanate from the very heart of the Titan city. The melody was piercingly sweet and resembled at times the singing of some voluptuous feminine voice. However, no human voice could have possessed the unearthly pitch, the shrill, perpetually sustained notes that somehow suggested the light of remote worlds and stars translated into sound. Ordinarily, I'm not very sensitive to music. I've even been reproached for not reacting more strongly to it. But I had not gone much farther when I realized the peculiar mental and emotional spell which the far-off sound was beginning to exert upon me. There was a siren-like allurement which drew me on. Forgetful of the strangeness and potential perils of my situation, and I felt a slow, drug-like intoxication of brain and senses. In some insidious manner, I know not how or why, the music conveyed the ideas of vast but attainable space and altitude, of superhuman freedom and exaltation, and it seemed to promise all the impossible splendors of which my imagination has vaguely dreamt. The forest continued almost to the city walls. Peering from behind the final boscage, I saw their overwhelming battlements in the sky above me and noted the flawless jointure of their prodigious blocks. I was near the great road, which entered an open gate large enough to admit the passage of behemoths. There were no guards in sight, and several more of the tall, gleaming entities came striding along and went in as I watched. From where I stood, I was unable to see inside the gate, for the wall was stupendously thick. The music poured from that mysterious entrance in an ever-strengthening flood and sought to draw me on with its weird seduction, eager for unimaginable things. It was hard to resist, hard to rally my willpower and turn back. I tried to concentrate on the thought of danger, but the thought was tenuously unreal. At last I tore myself away and retraced my footsteps, very slowly and lingeringly, till I was beyond the reach of the music. Even then the spell persisted, like the effects of a drug, and all the way home I was tempted to return and follow those shining giants into the city. August 5th I have visited the new dimension once more. I thought I could resist that summoning music, and I even took some cotton wadding along with which to stuff my ears if it should affect me too strongly. I began to hear the supernal melody at the same distance as before, and was drawn onward in the same manner. But this time, I entered the open gate. I wonder if I can describe that city. I felt like a crawling ant upon its mammoth pavements, amid the measureless babble of its buildings, of its streets and arcades. Everywhere there were columns, obelisks, and the perpendicular pylons of fane like structures that would have dwarfed those of Thebes and Heliopolis. And the people of the city! How is one to depict them or give them a name? I think that the gleaming entities I saw are not the true inhabitants, but are only visitors, perhaps from some other world or dimension like myself. The real people are giants, too, but they move slowly, with solemn, hieratic paces. Their bodies are nude and swart, and their limbs are those of caryatides, massive enough, it would seem, to uphold the roofs and lintels of their own buildings. I fear to describe them minutely, for human words would give the idea of something monstrous and uncouth, and these beings are not monstrous, but they have merely developed in obedience to the laws of another evolution than ours, the environmental forces and conditions of a different world. Somehow, I was not afraid when I saw them. Perhaps the music had drugged me till I was beyond fear. There was a group of them just inside the gate and they seemed to pay me no attention whatever as I passed them. The opaque, jet-like orbs of their huge eyes were impassive as the carven eyes of andro-sphinxes, and they uttered no sound from their heavy, straight, expressionless lips. Perhaps they lack the sense of hearing, 
for their strange semi-rectangular heads were devoid of anything in the nature of external ears. I followed the music, which was still remote and seemed to increase little in loudness. I was soon overtaken by several of those beings whom I had previously seen on the road outside the walls, and they passed me quickly and disappeared in the labyrinth of buildings. After them there came other beings of a less gigantic kind, and without the bright shards or armor worn by the first comers. Then, overhead, two creatures with long, translucent, blood-colored wings, intricately veined and ribbed, came flying side by side and vanished behind the others. Their faces, featured with organs of unsurmisable use, were not those of animals, and I felt sure that they were beings of a high order of development. I saw hundreds of those slow-moving, somber entities whom I have identified as the true inhabitants, but none of them appeared to notice me. Doubtless they were accustomed to seeing far weirder and more unusual kinds of life than humanity. As I went on, I was overtaken by dozens of improbable-looking creatures, all going in the same direction as myself, as if drawn by the same siren melody. Deeper and deeper I went into the wilderness of colossal architecture, led by that remote, ethereal, opiate music. I soon noticed a sort of gradual ebb and flow in the sound, occupying an interval of ten minutes or more, but by imperceptible degrees it grew sweeter and nearer. I wondered how it could penetrate that manifold maze of builded stone and be heard outside the walls. I must have walked for miles in the ceaseless gloom of those rectangular structures that hung above me, tier on tier at an awful height in the amber zenith. Then, at length, I came to the core and secret of it all. Preceded and followed by a number of those chimerical entities, I emerged on a great square, in whose center was a temple-like building more immense than the others. The music poured, imperiously shrill and loud from its many-columned entrance. I felt the thrill of one who approaches the sanctum of some hierarchical mystery when I entered the halls of that building. People who must have come from many different worlds or dimensions went with me and before me along the titanic colonnades whose pillars were graven with indecipherable runes and enigmatic bas-reliefs. Also the dark, colossal inhabitants of the town were standing or roaming about, intent, like all the others, on their own affairs. None of these beings spoke, either to me or to one another, and though several eyed me casually, my presence was evidently taken for granted. There are no words to convey the incomprehensible wonder of it all. And the music! I have utterly failed to describe that also. It was as if some marvelous elixir had been turned into sound waves, an elixir conferring the gift of superhuman life and the high magnificent dreams which are dreamt by the immortals. It mounted in my brain like a supernal drunkenness as I approached the hidden source. I do not know what obscure warning prompted me now to stuff my ears with cotton ere I went any farther, though I could still hear it, still feel its peculiar, penetrant vibration. The sound became muted when I had done this, and its influence was less powerful henceforward. There is little doubt that I owe my life to this simple and homely precaution. The endless rows of columns grew dim for a while as the interior of a long, basaltic cavern, and then, at some distance ahead, I perceived the glimmering of a soft light on the floors and pillars. The light soon became an overflooding radiance, as if gigantic lamps were being lit in the temple's heart, and the vibrations of the hidden music pulsed more strongly in my nerves. The hall ended in a chamber of immense, indefinite scope, whose walls and roof were doubtful with unremoving shadows. In the center, amid the pavement of mammoth blocks, there was a circular pit, above which seemed to float a fountain of flame that soared in one perpetual, slowly lengthening jet. This flame was the sole illumination, and also it was the source of the wild, unearthly music. Even with my purposely deafened ears, I was wooed by the shrill and starry sweetness of its singing. 
and I felt the voluptuous lure and the high vertiginous exaltation. I knew immediately that the place was a shrine, and that the trans-dimensional beings who accompanied me were visiting pilgrims. There were scores of them, perhaps hundreds, but all were dwarfed in the cosmic immensity of that chamber. They were gathered before the flame in various attitudes of worship. They bowed their exotic heads or made mysterious gestures of adoration with unhuman hands and members. And the voices of several, deep as booming drums or sharp as the stridulation of giant insects, were audible amid the singing of the fountain. Spellbound, I went forward and joined them, enthralled by the music and by the vision of the soaring flame. I paid as little heed to my outlandish companions as they to me. The fountain rose and rose till its light flickered on the limbs and features of throned, colossal statues behind it. Heroes, or gods, or demons from the earlier cycles of alien time, staring in stone from a dusk of illimitable mystery. The fire was white and dazzling. It was pure as the central flame of a star. It blinded me, and when I turned my eyes away, the air was filled with webs of intricate color, with swiftly changing arabesques, whose numberless unwanted hues and patterns were such as no mundane eye had ever beheld. I felt a stimulating warmth that filled my very marrow with intenser life. The music mounted with the flame, and I understood now its recurrent ebb and flow. As I looked and listened, a mad thought was born in my mind. The thought of how marvelous and ecstatical it would be to run forward and leap headlong into the singing fire. The music seemed to tell me that I should find in that moment of flaring dissolution all the delight and triumph, all the splendor and exaltation it had promised from afar. It besought me. It pleaded with tones of supernal melody. And despite the wadding in my ears, the seduction was well-nigh irresistible. However, it had not robbed me of all sanity. With a sudden start of terror, like one who has been tempted to fling himself from a high precipice, I drew back. Then I saw that the same dreadful impulse was shared by some of my companions. The two entities with scarlet wings whom I have previously mentioned were standing a little apart from the rest of us. Now, with a great fluttering, they rose and flew toward the flame like moths toward a candle. For a brief moment, the light shone redly through their half-transparent vans, ere they disappeared in the leaping incandescence, which flared briefly and then burned as before. Then, in rapid succession, a number of other beings who represented the most divergent trends of biology sprang forward and immolated themselves in the flame. There were creatures with translucent bodies, and some that shone with all the hues of the opal. There were winged colossi and titans who strode as with seven-league boots, and there was one being with useless abortive wings who crawled rather than ran to seek the same glorious doom as the rest. But among them were none of the city's people. These merely stood and looked on, impassive and statue-like as ever. I saw that the fountain had now reached its greatest height and was beginning to decline. It sank steadily but slowly to half its former elevation. During this interval there were no more acts of self-sacrifice, and several of the beings beside me turned abruptly and went away, as if they had overcome the lethal spell. One of the tall, armored entities, as he left, addressed me in words that were like clarion notes, with unmistakable accents of warning. By a mighty effort of will, in a turmoil of conflicting emotions, I followed him. At every step, the madness and delirium of the music strove within my instincts of self-preservation. More than once I started to go back. My homeward journey was blurred and doubtful as the wanderings of a man in an opium trance, and the music sang behind me and told me of the rapture I had missed, of the flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. August 9th I have tried to go on with a new story, but have made no progress. 
Anything that I can imagine or frame in language seems flat and puerile beside the world of unsearchable mystery to which I have found admission. The temptation to return is more cogent than ever. The call of that remembered music is sweeter than the voice of a loved woman. And always I am tormented by the problem of it all, and tantalized by the little which I have perceived and understood. What forces are these whose existence and working I have merely apprehended? Who are the inhabitants of the city? And who are the beings that visit the enshrined flame? What rumor or legend has drawn them from outland realms and ulterior planets to that place of inenarrable danger and destruction? And what is the fountain itself? And what the secret of its lure and its deadly singing? These problems admit of infinite surmise but no conceivable solution. I am planning to go back once more, but not alone. Someone must go with me this time as a witness to the wonder and the peril. It is all too strange for credence. I must have human corroboration of what I have seen and felt and conjectured. Also, another might understand where I have failed to do more than apprehend. Who shall I take? It will be necessary to invite someone here from the outer world, someone of high intellectual and aesthetic capacity. Shall I ask Philip Hastain, my fellow fiction writer? Hastain would be too busy, I fear. But there is the California artist Felix Ebenly, who has illustrated some of my fantastic novels. Ebenly would be the man to see and appreciate the new dimension if he can come. With his bent for the bizarre and unearthly, the spectacle of that plain and city, the Babylonian buildings and arcades and the Temple of the Flame, will simply enthrall him. I shall write immediately to his San Francisco address. August 12th. Ebenly is here. The mysterious hints in my letter regarding some novel pictorial subjects along his own line were too provocative for him to resist. Now I have explained fully and given him a detailed account of my adventures. I can see that he is a little incredulous, for which I hardly blame him, but he will not remain incredulous for long. For tomorrow we shall visit together the city of the singing flame. August 13th. I must concentrate my disordered faculties. I must choose my words and write with exceeding care. This will be the last entry in my journal, and the last writing I shall ever do. When I have finished, I shall wrap the journal up and address it to Philip Hastain, who can make such disposition of it as he sees fit. I took Ebenly into the other dimension today. He was impressed, even as I had been, by the two isolated boulders on Crater Ridge. They looked like the guttered ends of columns established by pre-human gods, he remarked. I begin to believe you now. I told him to go first, and indicated the place where he should step. He obeyed without hesitation, and I had the singular experience of seeing a man melt into utter, instantaneous nothingness. One moment he was there, and the next there was only bare ground, and the far-off tamaracks whose view his body had obstructed. I followed and found him standing in speechless awe on the violet grass. This, he said at last, is the sort of thing whose existence I have hitherto merely suspected, and have never even been able to hint in my most imaginative drawings. We spoke little as we followed the lines of monolithic boulders toward the plain. Far in the distance, beyond those high and stately trees with their sumptuous foliage, the golden-brown vapors had parted, showing the pale vistas of an immense horizon and past the horizon were range on range of gleaming orbs and fiery, flying motes in the depth of that amber heaven. It was as if the veil of another universe than ours had been drawn back. We crossed the plain, and came at length within earshot of the siren music. I warned Ebenly to stuff his ears with cotton wadding, but he refused. I don't want to deaden any new sensations which I may experience, he observed. We entered the city. My companion was in a veritable rhapsody of artistic delight when he beheld the enormous buildings and the people. I could see, too, that the music had taken hold upon him. 
His look soon became fixed and dreamy as that of an opium eater. At first he made many comments on the architecture and the various beings who passed us, and called my attention to details which I had not perceived before. However, as we drew nearer to the Temple of the Flame, his observational interest seemed to flag, and was replaced by more and more of an ecstatic inward absorption. His remarks became fewer and briefer, and he did not even seem to hear my questions. It was evident that the sound had wholly bemused and bewitched him. Even as on my former visit, there were many pilgrims going toward the shrine, and few that were coming away from it. Most of them belonged to evolutionary types that I had seen before. Among those that were new to me, I recall one gorgeous creature with golden and cerulean wings like those of a giant lepidopter, and scintillating jewel-like eyes that must have been designed to mirror the glories of some Edenic world. I too felt, as before, the captious thraldom and bewitchment, the insidious, gradual perversion of thought and instinct, as if the music were working in my brain like a subtle alkaloid. Since I had taken my usual precaution, my subjection to the influence was less complete than that of Ebonly. But nevertheless, it was enough to make me forget a number of things. Among them, the initial concern which I had felt when my companion refused to employ the same mode of protection as myself. I no longer thought of his danger, or my own, except as something very distant and immaterial. The streets were like the prolonged and wildering labyrinth of a nightmare, but the music led us forthrightly, and always there were other pilgrims. Like men in the grip of some powerful current, we were drawn to our destination. As we passed along the hall of gigantic columns and neared the abode of the fiery fountain, a sense of our peril quickened momentarily in my brain, and I sought to warn Ebonly once more but all my protests and remonstrances were futile. He was deaf as a machine, and wholly impervious to anything but the lethal music. His expression and his movements were those of a somnambulist. Even when I seized and shook him with such violence as I could muster, he remained oblivious. The throng of worshippers was larger than upon my first visit, the jet of pure incandescent flame was mounting steadily as we entered, and it sang with the white ardor and ecstasy of a star alone in space. Again, with ineffable tones, it told me the rapture of a moth-like death in its lofty soaring, the exultation and triumph of a momentary union with its elemental essence. The flame rose to its apex, and even for me, the mesmeric lure was well-nigh irresistible. Many of our companions succumbed, and the first to immolate himself was the giant Lepidopterous being. Four others of diverse evolutional types followed in appallingly swift succession. In my own partial subjection to the music, my own effort to resist that deadly enslavement, I had almost forgotten the very presence of Ebonly. It was too late for me to even think of stopping him when he ran forward in a series of leaps that were both solemn and frenzied, like the beginning of some sacerdotal dance, and hurled himself headlong into the flame. The fire enveloped him. It flared up for an instant with a more dazzling whiteness, and that was all. Slowly, as if from benumbed brain centers, a horror crept upon my conscious mind and helped to annul the perilous mesmerism. I turned while many others were following Ebonly's example, and fled from the shrine and from the city. But somehow the horror diminished as I went, and more and more I found myself envying my companion's fate, and wondering as to the sensations he had felt in that moment of fiery dissolution. Now, as I write this, I am wondering why I came back again to the human world. Words are futile to express what I have beheld and experienced. And the change that has come upon me beneath the play of incalculable forces in a world of which no other mortal is even cognizant. Literature is nothing more than the shadow of a shadow. And life 
with its drawn-out length of monotonous, reiterative days, is unreal and without meaning now in comparison with the splendid death which I might have had. The glorious doom which is still in store. I have no longer any will to fight the ever-insistent music which I hear in memory. And there seems to be no reason at all why I should fight it. Tomorrow I shall return to the city.